Good morning, y'all. Happy Sunday. Hope everybody's doing all right. Hope everybody has uh, had a good day, had a good weekend so far. I'm ready to get going for the dreaded M day tomorrow morning. <laughs> and uh, welcome to uh, live Q&A number 23. You know, I've done... As I said just a second ago, this is the 23rd, and I just figured out there is absolutely no reason for me to wear headphones. I'm not listening to anything, so I decided to put them on the rack there and <laughs> get rid of them. I don't know why I've been wearing them for 22 continuous episodes. Oh, well. So, thanks for joining me here. Uh, let's see... Who we got out here in the chat? Looks like we have Larry Blair, Leo Steger. How, how you doing, Leo? Uh, Stephen Toronto. You spell that however you want to. It's your story. You tell it your way. Um, Steve Nealon, Harneal Media, webmaster to the stars, sponsor of MarkLindsayCNC.com, which I forgot to update this morning. I'm going to get on that as soon as I'm done here. <laughs> Ah, uh, let's see, Kurt Bruegel from Bipolar Northern Wisconsin. I've lived in a few bipolar places too. You know, you don't like the weather? Wait 10 minutes, it'll change on you. Uh, Kevin Ells, awesome wood things, Mr. Matt Haas in the house. Um, Matt also runs an excellent channel for those of you who are interested in YouTube. It's called... All things YouTube. Very easy to find. He runs a uh, tidy little Keebler tree over there. He does a show on Mondays. Uh, see, it's 4 o'clock Pacific. 7, that would be, yeah, 7 Eastern. It's a great show. We have a good time. He talks mainly about YouTube for those of you who are interested in the insider stuff. It's a great time. It's a great show. He's got some good people that shows up over there. And it's just fun. So let's see. John DeRoos, Earl Walker, Bob Heltebridal, poster of all things humorous and borderline tasteful, tasteless, whichever way you want to go on that. Gary Hammett, Jason Pulliam, all for Boaten. Welcome aboard. Uh, see what I did there? William Devlin. Uh, boy, here we go. Tom from Boston, LB Sharp, and JBL Woodworking. How goes it, everybody? Thanks for joining me. Glad you could make it. Uh, this morning's video, um, uh, John DeRue says you want to know more about cold weather move to Minot, North Dakota. No, thank you. <laughs> I know people in North Dakota. You guys realize you are free to go. You know that, right? That's insanity. That is a new definition of cold. You know, no thanks. Um, back on to this morning's video. Uh, basically about taking a vector and using that vector's profile to enter a form tool. I used a fairly simple tool. Uh, and of course, I've had the bid in here for a month of Sundays and just took it outside to use it two days ago. So I don't have it with me right here. It was basically a simple profile for a simple bit. But the point remains that that is one of the ways of getting a profile bit entered into your tool database. It's actually probably the best way is to use a vector of the profile. Now, a couple of things I didn't mention in the video that uh, I was going to kind of wait and do something else uh, on that bit specifically. Um, I was going to wait and demonstrate that when uh, I actually go to use it, which may be weeks down the road. You on a profile bit, it's very, very important that the material be flat. And I mean, if that means 
putting it down on the CNC and then using it to flatten that top surface, so be it. Uh, that top surface of the material needs to be as flat as you can get it. Otherwise, if you've got any irregularities in the top surface, you're going to get irregularities in the profile uh, and have a lot of sanding to clean up. So that particular bit, the point cutting round over, can be used for fluting, for reading, things like that. But if you have an inconsistent top surface, you could be used, you could end up with uh, dips and ridges that you'll have to come back and sand. So it, it's, it is important, especially if you're doing any kind of a surface profiling, like uh, raised panels and et cetera, et cetera, which you can do on a CNC machine. Uh, it takes a lot of experimentation, though. I haven't quite gotten there yet. But uh, for something like that, I still tend to use uh, the router table. So, let's see. Um, we've had a few more people jump in here. Sarah and Kyle Turner, welcome aboard. Is that Wandcraft? Ah, uh, let's see. Ayal Peleg from Israel. Thanks for joining us. Data Arbogast. Carneo Media, could that be used to give a different look to an engraving? Yes, it certainly can. Uh, it's, you know, it's a cliche to say it, but the only limit your imagination. I mean, you can do some deep reading with it. You can engrave a simple pattern with it to give it a good, uh, a, a, a different look. I mean, just experiment. That's about... Uh, that, that's one of the beautiful things about the preview in V-Carve Aspire or Cut 2D is you can take a, a just whatever shape or pattern you want to use, set yourself a cutting depth uh, with a, just a profile toolpath cutting on the vector and just preview it and see if you get the look that you want. Uh, it's slightly different than a V-Bit. So it would give you a different look. Um, I could see where doing uh, raised lettering or even uh, just outlining uh, text or initials in like some of these monogram texts, things like that. That could give a very cool look. So let's see. Richard Poland, Ronald Ledger jumped in. All right. So, um, are there any questions at all on that video? The main thing is to see if you can find a vector that uh, describes the profile of that forming bit. Um, I'm going to be doing another video. It's be a couple weeks down the road where I'll take a, fo uh, a form bit like that, something with a little bit different profile, and I'm actually going to trace the profile, scan that tracing into the computer, and then do a bitmap trace on it, or just a hand trace. Probably just do a hand trace to kind of make things easier and show you how to do it if you don't have a... Uh, profile vector, how to create your own profile vector, basically. So it's not as difficult as you would think it is. You just have to have certain measurements, certain accurate measurements. So a good set of calipers will come in handy. At the worst, a uh, good machinist rule. So were there any questions on the video at all? I'm not seeing any at all. Other than folks talking about how cold it is, well, you know, it's winter time, folks. <laughs> that gets me going. I mean, I it's funny to listen to the news and they're talking about a winter storm is headed. It's winter. That's when you get winter storms. Come on, y'all. <laughs> so, let's see. In the next couple weeks... Um, I'm finishing up a project that I started um, a couple weeks back, and I have three videos recorded for it so far. 
Uh, got the cutting done the other day, and I'm going to get that video edited. And if everything turns out, I'll uh, start posting videos. I'm the kind of person who I want to have the project done before I start posting videos on that project. That way, if something happens, I have to abandon the project, abort the project, or it just has to go on hold. I don't have people sitting there waiting on something that may or may not ever finish, you know. So, I all has a uh, question here. Curious on how you would choose a profile bit. Would it start from finding a bit, then deciding what to do with it? Or would you say, I need such a profile and search for it? Or order a custom... Um, Generally speaking, I follow the advice my grandfather gave me years ago uh, when it was just talking about normal woodworking, and that is buy tools as I need them. I mean, there are so many different profiles out there that you could spend a lot of money on tools you'll never use. So if you need an OG bit for a project, that's the time to buy an OG bit. If you need a... 120 degree V bit for a project, that's the time to buy that 120 degree V bit. Uh, bits and accessories, that's just one of those things you can drive yourself nuts and spend a ton of money on tools you will never use. And um, I've done that and wow. So, so I hope that helps you out there, I'll, you know, get it when you need it and don't try to do a preemptive strike on that so let's see jeff restore 66 good morning jeff or good afternoon now it's just a little after 12 could you show me a screenshot that shows the tool in the new v carve 10 i don't know what you mean by that uh the video that i did this morning uh covers version 10 so that's how I enter a bit with a uh, uh, a profile bit or a form tool. So uh, let's see. Are you using form bits mainly to do border work on cutouts of your work and add some style to it? Um, kind of 50-50, Kurt. Like, for instance, this uh, plunge, the, the uh, point cutting roundover bit, as I said, could be used to create fluting and reading and things like that. But generally, yes, it's profile treatments. Um, just various, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of for people who have limited tools. A lot of folks, the CNC and maybe a table saw or bandsaw is about all they have with some sanders. So they don't have a router table. I find that on most of my projects, a router table or a just a handheld trim router with like uh, a chamfer bit in it or a V-bit in it, I can get a good, nice uh, edge. And I don't need to rely on the CNC to do that. It's quicker for me to put a bit in a router table than it is to do a tool path and everything else. So it's just kind of a 50-50. I'm just showing what can be done and how to do it with the CNC, but it's not always the right tool for the job. Um, I tend to do most of my roundovers with a... Uh, a roundover bit with a guide bearing on it, unless it's something super, super intricate. But I have needed a point cutting roundover bit for a while, finally got one. Now I can move on to a project where I'm going to use that bit. So, um, Bob Helt Bridal, when creating a bit profile, you can't program an undercut. No, that's correct. It will, the, the software will not program in an undercut so something that cuts wider at the bottom than it does at the top will not be modeled that's why if you watch my how to enter a keyhole bit into the tool database and use a keyhole bit you'll notice i just set it up as a regular end mill using the large diameter for the diameter of the keyhole bit and um, just simply because it will not program in that undercut so that's uh, a software limitation. I don't know if they're working on that or not, but it's something to do with the rendering and the creation of the toolpath. It just won't do it. So, 
Let's see. Uh, I.L. Peleg, what is an OG bit? Okay, it's spelled O-G-E-E. -E. And an OG is just a shape of a side profile. Um, your best bet would be to Google OG. Again, that's O-G-E-E. -E. And uh, then click on images and you'll see what an OG looks like. It's a certain profile, a certain edge treatment. So, uh, let's see. The Dirty Knobs, he who dies with the most toys wins. True, but he still dies. Or most tools wins, excuse me. True, but he still dies. <laughs> let's see. Jeffrey Hansen, what fonts do you recommend for carving signs? Oh boy, that's a can of worms all of its own. Because again, you can go crazy. Um, I have a couple of websites that I use for fonts. In fact, what I'm going to do, I will link a video in the description uh, that I did, oh, last year sometime, about adding and previewing fonts to vCarve Aspire, the rest of them. And in it, I recommend a couple of websites where I get my fonts, where I look for fonts, and a website that lets you preview all the fonts. Now, having said that, this is a Flash website, and a lot of people don't like Flash. So, um, and that website also now, because... Um, Google Chrome has stopped supporting Flash Player. Uh, that website now has an app that you can download straight to your computer, at, which will do the same thing. Just, it's wordmark.it. And uh, what it'll do is it loads the names of all of the fonts you have in your computer onto that website. And then it previews whatever text you enter into a text box in the fonts that you have so that you can kind of look through and see what you like. But uh, I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. Let's see, font, writing it down. All right, I'll put that link in the description box to this video as soon as it goes live and we're done here. Give me about 10 minutes and it'll be there in the description box. So, but yeah, uh, fonts are kind of like tools. You can go nuts downloading fonts like crazy that you will never use and just have way too many on a computer. Uh, in fact, what I tend to do is if I need a specific font for one job and I'm not going to use it again, I'll install it, run that job. Then after that project has been delivered, I get rid of that font so I don't have 10,000 fonts in my computer. So... Uh, let's see, Mervyn Schumacher, has anybody used a drag bit on glass? Uh, I haven't, um, and it's just because I haven't needed to, so. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff says, sorry, I would like to see what new bits they have added. They haven't added any new bits, uh, if that's what you're talking about, Jeff. Uh, the only thing that has changed is the setup in the database. You can now select the material. Like, for instance, um, I have softwoods and hardwoods, uh, two different settings in the database. So now you can uh, set the material to hardwoods and set your quarter-inch end mill for certain speeds and feeds and what have you then you can set up that same end mill for softwoods with different feeds and speeds. So if you're going to cut a pattern that you cut several times, you have one design and you use it in different materials, you can load that design into the software. Then when you go to select a tool, you say, okay, I'm cutting this in pine, let's do softwoods. And so all the feeds and speeds for softwoods that you have entered, that's what's going to be used. If the next time you cut it, you want to cut it out of maple, you can go into your tool database and select maple, for example, or just hardwoods, however you set it up. Um, for that setup, I would highly recommend going to the Vectric tutorial uh, on how to set up that database. But as far as new bits that they have added, they've not added any. The, the And the... 
bits that are entered in their tool database are just examples. I would not go by the feeds and speeds that they have entered there. I would use them as a reference point, but they just use the numbers that are in there for their bits are placeholders. Just to show you where you need to enter your feed rate, your router RPMs, your plunge rates, your step over, all of that. Those are just placeholders. Don't go by their recommendations because it's probably, I won't say probably, it may not be appropriate for your machine. So always use the settings for your machine, your tools. So let's see. All for Boaten, you are right on getting a tool when you need it. I'm a tool hoarder and love handling tools on hand. Well, I think that's a law. You know, I think we all do that. And um, it's just part of what we do. I mean, you can only have so many hand planes. You can only have so many squares. You can only have so many levels. But that doesn't stop me from getting more when I see somebody's got one at a ridiculous price at a yard sale, you know. <laughs> so Louis Delgado uh, good day question I just got a new laptop and downloaded the free trial how do I download the full grant program okay you already purchased it about eight months ago this is the perfect example of get hold of Vectric Tech support they will give you a link to where you go to download it um I could go through a bunch of stuff. It's basically through the V and Company website, uh, through your customer portal. But get hold of Vectric Tech Support. Email them today and ask them, how do I go about getting the full program that I purchased? And make sure you send that email from the email you use to purchase the product, okay? And uh, because they look it up in their records and they will they will take care of you. They'll get you hooked up. So. All right. Let's see. Are there any further questions on today's video or anything else for that matter? So Gary Seema. Hello, Mark. I just got an incredible package deal, including a shark CNC. Sweet <laughs> score. All right. Good luck with it. Have fun setting it up. Have fun setting it up and using it. That's great. I like it when people get brand new machines. So, um, yeah, I haven't set up a new machine in, well, two years to be exact. It's a lot of fun. But uh, I don't know. I, I'm like a five-year-old kid with some of this stuff. I've only been doing CNC for five years. But, and everybody has told me that you'll get over that stuff. I have not yet reached that stage. They'll tell me, you get tired of watching it. I just, you know, there's something about it. I go in, I turn on the computer, I load Mach 3, I fire up the controller, pick up my little game controller and move it, and it's just, there's a little part of me in here that turns into a five-year-old. So. <laughs> okay, Gary Sima. Uh, what do you recommend as a first sign project? Something simple, something you like. Um, start with your name or your address. I did a series on V carving for the absolute beginner. And I'll put a link to that in the description, a link to the playlist. It's four videos. And the first video is the basics, how the V carving works, what determines how deep a bit cuts, etc. And the second video in that is the simple address sign. Now, you don't have to use numbers. You can go in and just put your name in there if you want. And that'll, you know, a, a little basic design, a basic sign that'll get you started. And um, it can be anything you want to make. I mean, just pick something you like, a wood you like, pick a font you like, and... Do something simple. Your name, your address, um, a favorite slogan, uh, whatever. And just kind of practice. Uh, something that I did when I was first getting into this was rather than cut up a lot of expensive materials, 
I went cheap. I got on my local Craigslist and I looked in the free section for scrap wood that people were getting rid of. And I brought home a bunch of fence boards from a guy who had a section of fence blow down and he replaced his whole fence. He had a bunch of fence boards to give away. And I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense for that to end up in the landfill because nobody wants them. So I went and got them and I taught myself how to use my machine and I still have a bunch of them on those fence boards. So whenever I'm doing a new technique, I'm learning, I'm practicing or something like that, I cut up an old fence board. It's better to keep it out of the landfill and you're not spending a bunch of money on material that you may or may not make mistakes on. So uh, just get in and draw and design. There's no suggestions for a first project. Just keep it basic, keep it simple until you learn. It's just like any other tool until you learn how to use your machine, how to set your X, Y, and Z zero, how to clamp it or mount it firmly to the table, and uh, how to cut, and just go for the gusto. So, let's see. Um, Benji Long, hope all is well. Love CNC. Well, yeah, I love CNC too. All is going very well. For those of you who have been asking, my wife Linda, who had knee surgery in November, she's doing excellent. She's about up to about 97%. She's not quite ready to start driving yet. Got to still work on her reaction time, but she's getting around just fine. So, uh, let's see. All for Boaten. Want to do acrylic lighted sign next? Do I want to use V bits or drag bits? I'm the wrong person to ask that. I'm sorry. I have yet to do an acrylic sign, edge lit sign, although it has been on my list for a while. Let me write that down. Uh, I, I, I need to get some uh, acrylic and start experimenting with it. I've been wanting to do one for a while. I just haven't. So I can't really help you now, but what can I say? Uh, let's see. Richard Weiss from North Carolina. Any suggestions on a game controller? Okay, that is a loaded question because it's going to depend on your control software. Some software is just not compatible with a game controller. Others are. Whatever you're using for your controller software, be it Mach 3, Mach 4, uh, WinCNC, UCCNC, whatever you're using, um, your best bet would be to go to that software's website and look for their support forum. You will usually on their website see something that says support, and if you click that, you'll go to a page. A support forum is usually one of the options. The way support forums work, there may be one or two employees of the company that are on the forum, but the majority of these support forums are people, users just like you and me, who are there to, you know, share tips and tricks and um, just answer questions, ask questions, learn from one another. And usually, 99 times out of 100, if you have a question or an issue, somebody there has either had the same issue or knows how to fix that issue. And they are the people that know your machine or your software best. Now, I can tell you what I use. I use Mach 3 on a uh, computer running Windows XP, and I use an Xbox 360 controller. And there are, there's a plug-in for Mach 3 that you have to download. I will link the video that I use to set up my Xbox 360 controller because I did it so long ago, I don't remember everything. So let's go to... I'll write that down. It's a uh, gentleman named Steve who runs the channel Guru Brew. He... Um, did a video on setting up an Xbox 360 controller with Mach 3. So I'll put that link in the description box of this video when it goes live. So let's see. Um, Solly's Drone Media. Hey, mate from Australia here. Howdy. Welcome aboard. 
There's a lot of talk about Mach 3, freezing, missing steps, etc. Your thoughts. I've never had an issue like that that wasn't of my own making. Having said that, if you're just starting out and you don't already have a Mach 3 license, I would highly suggest you go with Mach 4. That's the newest, most current version of the software. And um, it's this is kind of one of those personal preference things. I bought a Mach 3 license five years ago before Mach 4 was out. So I have the Mach 3 license. Mach 3 works for me. I have no reason to change. However, if I was just starting out now, I would definitely buy Mach 4. Always stay with the most current technology, especially in something like this. So, um, yeah, I, I have never had any problem with missteps being caused by the controller software. I've not had any problem with Mach 3 freezing either. However, let me say one thing about that. The control software needs to be the number one priority on that computer. Now, like I say, I use an old HP desktop computer running Windows XP, and that's all it does. It can't go online. It doesn't have any music software. It doesn't even have antivirus software. It's a dumb terminal. It stands by itself. Its only job is to run Mach 3. There's no antivirus software. There are no screensavers. There's no power saving, no energy conservation routines running in the background. It doesn't try to go online and update itself. It just runs Mach 3 and Mach 3 only. That's the best way I have found to, to run it. But um, more often than not, um, well, I won't even say that. It depends on the machine. A lot of missteps issues are mechanical issues and not uh, software related. And that's something I try to tell folks all the time. Before you do any getting into software or what have you, always check the mechanical first. Because you can drive, your crazy, drive yourself crazy with settings only to find out you have a loose belt, a loose coupler, or uh, a bearing is dragging or something like that. So always check the mechanical first. So let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Mike Smith saw some split text last night on Dave's channel. Would like to learn this. I've been thinking about doing a video on that. Um, there were a lot of... That was real popular a couple of years ago. It's not really all that popular now. Uh, it kind of went out of fashion, that and uh, monograms. But uh, I'll put it on the list of videos to do. Um, I, I make my own split text. I'll show how to do it, and then I'll show a few fonts that are already done for you. So... Let's see. Um, uh, Otto McKay. Hi, Mark. Just purchased a new CNC. Do you have a video on how to set it up properly? Just a newbie, so any help would be appreciated. Uh, another prime example. Contact the, the machine's manufacturer. No two machine brands are alike. I mean, they all have their own proprietary setup. And uh, now, if you bought one of the imported machines that the manufacturer doesn't really have a uh, website. Um, you may kind of be on your own there. You can go for your controller software setup. You can go to that controller software's website. Um, you can also try websites like the CNC Zone, which is a forum, and read through there and see if... Um, any of these, like you're talking about a 3060 machine or a, something like that. I, some of the less expensive generic machines, the tech support isn't all that good. So, um, But there are so many variables that um, I really couldn't help you set it up. This is uh, one of those cases of where, you know, if you bought a Shape Oco, by all means go to the Shape Oco website and get into their support forum. And ask your questions there. They know your machine. I don't. Uh, same thing with XCarve, Laguna, 
Axiom, whatever. Hit their websites, hit their support forum, and because uh, they know your machine. So, let's see. Um, can you use both a drag and a V bit on acrylic. Okay, cool. Good to know. Make sure you flame polish the edge for the light. I've seen people do the flame polishing and just, I have worked with acrylic before. I had a very short career at a plastics fabricator while we were stationed over in Hawaii. And yes, flame polishing is excellent. It will make it transparent for sure. Only one thing to remember, if you flame polish the edge on acrylic, and it doesn't matter what type of flame it is, whether it be map gas, propane, hydrogen, once that edge is flame polished, do not hit it with any solvents at all. It will crack and craze like you wouldn't believe. Don't hit it with any solvents. Even some polishes are kind of iffy. But once you have flame polished it, leave it alone. Use, it on, use only water to clean it. Uh, let's see. Les Clemens using a mini wireless keyboard on Mach 4. Yeah, I haven't. I, I tend to stay away from wireless goodies like that and peripherals because I know me, I will leave it turned on and not go back out there for a week and have nothing but dead batteries. That's just me. So let's see. A funny about the fence board. I did the outline of a bottle and put a bottle opener to the bottom and put it on the deck. Hey, you know, whatever works. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, um, sure. Okay, William Devlin says Centroid Acorn CNC 12 software. Yes, I have absolutely no idea what that is. Have never used it. Never used it at all. I'm a Mach 3 guy, and that's about it. So, all right. Um, it looks like, wow, we've been on for 37 minutes. Yeah, we've still got 58 people watching, but I'm about run out of things to kill time with. I don't want to take up all of your Sunday. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along and asking questions. I know, you know, I've... I've some folks think I'm a CNC expert. I am not. I've been doing CNC for five years. I know the the tools, supplies, software, and hardware that I use. But my whole point in this channel is to try to help folks who have never done this kind of thing before. Show them that you can get into the software and design a project. That it looks more complicated than it actually is but it's just like anything else you just have to get in it do it and practice and you know you'll quickly discover that it's not as technical as you thought it was there are certain rules but more often than not you're the one that makes the final decision on what bit to use, what font to use, what wood to use. And that's just based on what you like. So, or what the customer slash client likes. That's more important because at the end of the day, you don't have to like it. They do. And um, that's the important part. So, all righty. Let's uh, go ahead and wrap this up and uh, we will do this again next week. I'm not going to give any clues or hints or anything on what video I'm going to put up next week. I've got four options, but suffice to say there will be another live Q&A. So as usual, uh, the best way to get a hold of me if you have questions about the video is either in the YouTube comments or hit my website, marklindsaycnc.com, and hit the Contact Us link. I cannot answer Facebook or Instagram PM requests. There just are not enough hours in the day, and I'm constantly on the run here, especially lately. For some reason, I've been running around at Mach 3 with my hair on fire. So, oh, by the way, it is official. I will announce it. It is official. Some of you who are 
friends with me on Facebook or in some of the groups that uh, I'm in, you already know this. <coughs> Excuse me. I will be attending the Vectric Users Group meeting in San Diego in September. I believe it's September 25th and 26th or 26th, 27th. But anyway, that's it. So it's, you know, nine months away, plenty of time to plot and plan. But I have booked my room. I have booked the conference, the Vectric user group meeting in San Diego. No, I'm not doing any kind of a presentation there. I'm not doing any speaking. I'm going to be sitting out in the audience with y'all. So I hope to see some of you there. And, you know, I'm kind of hard to miss. Come up, say hello. I'll bring some stickers and pass them around and stuff like that. So uh, that's the Vectric Users Group meeting in the U.S. in San Diego, California, September. I think it's 25th and 26th. But go to the Vectric website and look for it. You cannot miss it. And hope to see you all there. All right. I will see you all next week. You all have a great day. Get out in the shop, make some chips, but above all else, y'all take care.